Okay, Mark meets John Townsend, founder and creative partner at New Startup Agency Now. Hi, John. Hi. Thanks for inviting me in. Can you give us a very quick summary of your career to date? I mean, quick. Quick, quick. <laughs> so I started uh, uh, as an account executive in um, uh, agencies like uh, DMBNB uh, and then Ogilvy and Mather. Then I uh, decided I wanted to be a proper writer, so I, I went up to the best writer in the, in the business at the time. Uh, he gave me what was called a copy test. And then I, then I did DNAD courses at night, so I was working in the day as the account man, and then at night I was doing DNAD. And eventually, the creative director of the agency rumbled that I was up to something and said, uh, gave me a job as a junior in the department. So I was at Ogilvy's for about uh, seven years, and then at an agency called Yellow Hammer, um, where we had a great run of work, um, a very good creative agency, completely different to the sort of great big monolith of an American agency. Though I admired Ogilvy very much at the time, they had some fantastic campaigns like Pure Genius, My Mate Marmite. Everyone that, everyone that I've met that has worked at Ogilvy or still works at Ogilvy yeah. has a favourite David Ogilvy quote. You must have one. Uh, I like the principle of gentlemen with brains, but it's a little bit old fashioned now, given that 50% uh, uh, of the people we work with are women. But I like the spirit of that. Uh, yeah. After Ogilvy? Um, then uh, there was oh, Yellow Yellow Hammer. Hammer. And then Yellow Hammer was bought by DMBNB, where I'd originally started, so it was a uh, do not pass go, go back to Full the start. Circle, yeah. uh, and I had a group there, and then I um, joined uh, a business called Rapier, which was a direct marketing agency at the time, and um, interested in adding on sort of advertising, creativity, and strategy. And so I went to join the, the founder of there and became partner there and was there for 13 years where I learned all about integration and I had no idea what DM was apart from um, it was the poor relation of advertising and everyone was <laughs> snooty about it um, but incredibly useful because the way the world's gone now with digital uh, and the media explosion we ended up sort of handling everything from shooting Uma Thurman on telly for Virgin Media to doing a, a price rise mailing for them or uh, cross-selling emails so Learning about this, the, bre the breadth of media was kind of uh, sometimes challenging, but it was incredibly useful because I always think that the, uh, it's, you need to reflect the things that your clients have to worry about. And marketing directors tend to, well, they have a whole range of stuff from promotions to direct marketing to digital to brand to PR to pricing and everything else. So I think the more that you, the more that you understand of the media, better position you are to give some sensible advice on how to spend it. And here we are at now. Oh, yes. Uh, how, how old is now? Uh, we are a year and a month old. Okay. Yeah. It's gone pretty quick. Yeah. So it's been amazing. Um, and what's the agency's positioning? Uh, we, I mean, I really originally, I always wanted to have an agency that clients really trust. And I always think that you, uh, if a client trusts you, then you can do much, much better work for them because they don't believe you're doing it just to get away with stuff for your own uh, portfolio. Um, but we're, we're kind of essentially about creating action. So we're about, it's perfectly reasonable nowadays to expect that your money works immediately and also that you can build brands and build a business at the same time. So the old division between doing very slow burn, long term brand building stuff and then do all the grubby promotional stuff. Um, which was the conventions of advertising, I don't think that holds anymore. I think, you know, clients are much more promotional now inherently uh, in the way they do business. So. so the solutions that you're coming up with are across all medias? Yeah, we, we kind of say that we don't necessarily want to do everything for you, but we'd like to be in a position to help you, to help advise you on what messages to put in what media, how to use the media, and we do actually do, we've done a lot of sort of internal thoughts for companies, say for, for BT, they were interested in a brand idea that worked inside their company first and then translated into advertising. Um, and we do digital and we do some direct marketing. Uh, so you know, we tend to sort of go with the club what the clients want. But our whole start point is what's the problem and how do we solve it? Yeah. And yeah. um, why the name now? Um, immediate action, immediate measurable results. Uh, the idea that and advertising is incredibly transient and it has to be about immediacy. 
has been relevant to the moment. Um, so the first thing, I guess, was about results. The second thing was uh, about innovation and how do you use media differently. And, you know, the, the things you've got to play with now are so different to uh, the stuff in the old days, I guess. There's much more events. Um, you think about events, you think about PR, you think about combining media, using digital in a way that no one ever dreamed of. So it was about being innovative and also about, you know, when setting up the agency and talking to clients, it's quite interesting that the, the notion as a creative that just the creative work matters isn't completely true. Is that actually clients want, they're just as bothered about the process. And I found in big agencies the process really cumbersome. So now it's about getting people around the table together and the creative people and the business people together so that you don't get that sort of Chinese whispers process that happens in agencies. Yeah. What's the, I'm interested to find out what the most embarrassing thing that's happened to you in your career. You must have a few stories uh, over the years. <coughs> God, tons. I once went into a pitch and uh, this was a chemistry meeting for a pitch for a certain, for a yogurt brand and I really liked them and I got really overexcited and enthusiastic <laughs> talking to them and I thought I felt so comfortable uh, with them that I said, to, well, you know, let's face it, you've got a, a really ugly name and really ugly packaging so I think we should make a benefit of that and then at that point we were, it probably wasn't a very smart thing to, to do. That was one, there must be lots of others but I can't remember <laughs> immediately. Yeah. Um, you came from a slightly different background. Uh, you, uh, I saw on your LinkedIn profile that you studied at Eton, mm -hmm. but what was it you studied there? Um, that was standard school stuff, history, geography, English, physics, uh, drama. And then did you go to uni after that? Then I went to London University and didn't study much like most people at university. Um, and then I just applied to agencies. In those days it was really unsophisticated, I just remember I got the top 20 agencies list and I wrote to all of them and I got zero response. And I realised my CV was just dull, uh, so I rewrote it and made it a bit more lively. And I got about three interviews and I got offered a job at what was then DMBNB, which is obviously now part of the other So when you were starting out, obviously as a, a young account exec, mm -hmm. uh, did you ever see yourself owning an agency at some point in your career? <coughs> no. I don't know. I didn't think. I think that. For, I didn't think that far ahead. I mean, I remember I always kind of. When I became a creative, I wanted to get uh, an ad in the book within three years, and I was quite ambitious in that sense. I think I always knew I wanted to be in charge of my destiny, and part of the reason for leaving DMBNB to go to Rapier was to be in control of something, because it was 23 people, I could kind of make something of it. And um, I hated the idea of being in a great big corporate monolith where you, you can't have conversations with the people who are making decisions. And, um, you kind of get strategies handed down to you from the middle of nowhere. Uh, you're not part of anything, you know. <laughs> We've just won a pitch. <laughs> good timing, that's how everyone's cheering. <laughs> yeah, so that was good news. <laughs> good. Um, yeah, so I just, I, I've always wanted to be in control of my destiny a bit, and I, I just love, uh, I love being a smaller place that's nimble. Uh, I think it's more fun, you know. Um, when you were growing up in the industry, you were a young boy, who did you look up to? Who, were there agencies that, or people individually that... God, so many. Yeah, my first mentor was a guy called Indra Sinha, who was a fantastic um, copywriter, who was famous for all the uh, sort of ads for the Imperial War Museum. He wrote beautiful corporate ads for Shell. He then became a, a, the, the, the trustee of the Bo Powell Trust, and he used to do all the Amnesty International ads. And he just made the art of writing just made you inspired by it and he just uh, he made it a joy to learn to write and th then he went on to write a Booker Prize nominated novel <clears throat> and then there's people who you know people there's so many people I admire I really admired um, I mean Tim Delaney for his craft and uh, the, the the advertising that uh, that he did was fantastic I also obviously people like David Abbott great writers um, and then um, then I guess uh, People, I guess John Hegarty, who changed the idea of advertising into being much more of a, a visual and artistic thing. And I just have always, I would just, I totally admire someone who's created an agency that's creative integrity has maintained through lots of 
changes in management and over God, how many, 25 years, yeah. um, you've got to admire that, it's brilliant. What advice would you give to people who are currently considering moving or changing careers from being an account exec to being a creative? Because it happens quite a lot and, and some people struggle and some people find it really easy. <clears throat> Gosh, um, you've got to go and get a portfolio together. I mean, the thing is, first of all, is you know, you've got to want to do it, I think. The truth is, it's a really, you know, you can't half do it. And it's like anything, if, you're, if, you're, if you want to do it, but you're not, so you've got a little bit of not sureness, then go for it, and then at least you know, if you commit to it, you know whether it's for you or not. But I would say you've got to um, go and speak to someone very senior in the creative department and ask for advice. Uh, get a portfolio together, do a DNAD course. I mean, if you haven't been in your career that long, you go to one of the great colleges. To learn it. If someone approached you here mm. in this agency who was an account handler yeah. and was interested in moving over to creative, how would you handle it? And would you yeah. handle it differently knowing that you had the opportunity, you were given the opportunity to to, to prove yourself as a creative? I would, you know, I'd obviously be a lot more sympathetic than most. I think most people would be sympathetic, but everyone is, if, you say, if someone is young and enthusiastic, and you can help them, then I think you always do. I would just say to them, okay, if you're really serious about it, then go and do a DNAD evening course, students course, get a portfolio together, come and get advice on it, work really hard on it, and keep on going. And I mean, I kind of believe, you know, my approach was, I'm a sort of 99% perspiration type of guy. And I so having kind of, as an accountant, I know that if you really, really want something and you really try hard, uh, and you listen to the right people all the time, then you can get it. So I would just say, you know, these are the functional things you can do, but in your mind, you just have to commit to it. And go and listen and absorb, and don't be afraid to ask people. It's amazing how, uh, when you're younger, you think, well, I'm not going to bother them because they're too busy or too senior or all that stuff. And, and my experience is that everyone, however old they are, loves being able to um, part. Yeah. Come across as approachable and yeah, and be helpful. Yeah. Um, what's your favourite ad campaign of all time? Uh, Is there one that stands out, maybe that you've done or, or one that you've grown up on? <laughs> God, you know, I I love the Tango Slap ad when it came out. I thought that was absolutely brilliant. I love the Guinness Surfers ad. I love the Economist for the its wit and elegance of language and, and sort of purity and simplicity of it. Um, too many to say, but they're just a few. Uh, and I, but I, when I started, I used to look at all old, old-fashioned advertising. So I read all the books about the '60s in America, and you know, worked for Avis and Volkswagen and all that stuff that people still talk about. It's just really worth looking at because then it's still fresh today, and I still, um, I still love looking at that stuff because I think the use of language, the economy. And the sort of braveness of strategies that they had in those days when it wasn't done to be a bit self-deprecating or be a bit ballsy. Um, so I really admire that stuff. Uh, and I think it's really important that if you're going into a business to really understand the history of stuff. It's interesting, isn't it? Because being in the industry, you feel like it's so progressive and it's moved ahead and things have changed. But yeah. the craft of advertising, um, <coughs> what makes a successful ad in the 60s still is yeah. relevant today. Yeah. I think the whole thing about digital and everything's becoming digital now, and my God, what do we do? I think the truth is, I mean, I'm actually quite old-fashioned in the sense that I believe that the principles of uh, understanding a, a client's company and their business and distilling it into something that's powerful and simple and then expressing it really creatively is just the same as it always has been. And I think the parameters are different now and the media that you use are different, but... Um, I think people have forgotten that. I think, yeah. I think people have tried to overcomplicate things yeah. and, and forgotten the real beauty of what makes simple. it. Simple. Yeah. You know, you remember the really simple ad campaigns, and uh, you know, I quoted the overview stuff earlier, but there was sort of uh, you could name them in two words and you knew what the campaign was about. And actually, I think um, with clients are sending this blunderbuss of communications out in different media that reaches people at different times and all that stuff, I think they. I think you need a, the, the simple ideas, advertising ideas, are probably more important than they ever have been. And I've got, I, we do lots of stuff on tone of voice, so it's not just the idea, it's what's the art directional look, how's it all hang together across all the media, what's the tone of voice, lots of tone of voice conversations. 
um, people like Virgin really get tone yeah. um, and the value of that. So I think they're kind of, and they're all craft skills, that's all, just applied in different places. How hands on are you these days as a creative? Um, oh, I love doing the work still. I really enjoy it and I still do it. And um, it's really rewarding seeing people who you have brought in doing great work. I find that really satisfying, but I love doing the work myself. So do you well, well, typically good. oversee and sign work off, or, or you do you get hands down? Yeah, to yeah, yeah. No, I do. I do a lot of the work for pitches. I always muck in with everyone else. I still love doing it, and it's a bit like you know, it's like it's a desk job otherwise. And I like doing the you, yeah. you do the job because you like doing the work, and I really like still doing it. Um, and also, you often get asked to help uh, when the stuff's quick turnaround, and the benefits of being old are that you can you tend to be quicker. Um, and I hire a lot of, you know, my first hirings were two very, very senior creatives because, again, I kind of really value those, the depth of experience and their, their clarity of thought um, and also the efficiency and speed of senior teams. Yeah. Uh, and then you hire younger people to, and then they're surrounded by good talents and they get better and better. Yeah, no, it's a nice model. I think obviously you need the support as well. Yeah, experience creatives. Totally, totally, and you know, I totally value that. I've got two very senior, Steve Paskin and Lee Goulding here, who are have just done it and are brilliant. Um, and then we've got a very young team from Falmouth, who are learning, you know, learning all the time to sit next to them. Um, what, do, uh, what do creators have to do to grab your attention? If, if it, it's so competitive these mm. days, and, and, and maybe not any more competitive from when you first entered the industry, but um, there are a lot of agencies around and a lot of new startups mm. and um, creatives generally are looking for something a bit different. So if they want to grab your attention and want to get in front of you, what, what would they have to do? I don't really buy the idea of gimmicks. Okay. I mean, if you write a really smart letter um, or you send me something very interesting, then I'll probably notice it. But I, in my view, is I've always, uh, I remember when I started, I had a very aggressive creative directors um, who, yeah, they were kind of just, didn't like me or, and I found it really hard work. And I've always thought I never wanted to treat young creatives badly. Yeah. So I always try and get back to people. But I mean, if you write a really smart letter, I remember we, we had a Save the Rhino campaign at my last agency. And someone wrote a letter saying, Dear John, I, I love rhinos, I love their dry old skin, I love their cute little eyes, I love that. You know, and she just wrote a very on point because it was about something relevant to me, very charming letter. And I couldn't not see her. So um, uh, sometimes it works, but in the end, you just look for really lively ideas, the ability to simplify, the ability to get a, sort of a single strand of thought and express it in different ways. Um, and then when you meet them, nice and incredibly bright, and uh, people who listen, and I always found that the best creatives are the brightest ones, and the bright people listen. Yeah. Um, how, how important is the involvement of strategy within creative? Because I've noticed the trend uh, in a lot of agencies where creatives are expected now, more senior, more experienced creatives are expected to not just come up with, with ideas and mm. never see them again, to, to actually look at its strategy. Uh, and obviously working closely with planners and strategists, but how strategic, how important is strategy to creators these days? Uh, you can't have great ideas without a great strategy. Uh, I think, you know, the, the thinking behind a campaign, so I talked about Avis a really long time ago. They had a strategy which is, we're only number two, um, so we try harder. And that's genius to be brave enough to say, to acknowledge it, which yeah. no one would. <clears throat> it gives you a really logical place to start like why, we're, why we're competitive. So, and still, you know, the best campaigns have really good strategic thinking. I think the question, and I think, is that where does the strategy come from? Sometimes it comes from the strategy of people, planners, and sometimes it comes from creative. My, my experience is the best creatives are good strategic thinkers. And you often get a relatively uh, ordinary strategy, but it's expressed brilliantly um, creatively, and it's the leap by the creative team that makes it different. But I think, you know, it's, it's everything. Yeah. Well, what do you do in your spare time? 
Me, I, uh, I like, I go to Norfolk, I like going to the beach, I play with my kids, I end up trampolining with them, I play the drums, I like skiing, uh, I like watching telly and being a complete vegetable, and I like um, food and restaurants. So how have you got time to do all of that? <laughs> I don't. I do bits. And where, do you live in London or do you live Yeah, London? I live in London. Okay. Uh, but I go to Norfolk at weekends. So it's nice to get, my roots. And get yeah. some fresh air. And... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Nice, okay, let's move on to a quick fire round. Can Lion or DNA beat Pencil? Lion. Olympic gold medal or no. Oscar? Oscar. Brightest person you've worked with? Indra Sinner. Most creative person you've worked with? Indra Sinner. And the best looking person you've worked with? That's ridiculous. My old art director, Kevin Bradley, <laughs> in his day. <laughs> Creatives or suits? Creatives, of course. Apple or Android? Apple. Ant or deck? <laughs> I, never get, I can't remember which is what I think deck. Spice Girls or Girls Allowed? Girls Allowed. Interesting, okay. Facebook or Twitter? Uh, Twitter. Favourite flavour crisps? They used to do... Uh, Marmite flavoured in there. Oh, really? Bob Rule, yeah. <laughs> take that or Westlife? Oh, take that. Cool. Degree or no degree? Degree. Art directors or copywriters? Copywriters. The Only Way is Essex or Nathan Chelsea? Oh. Essex, because I cringe more at Chelsea, I think. Interesting. I thought you were going to say Nathan Chelsea. Yeah, because I'm posh. <laughs> <laughs> Retains work or pitch work? Sorry? Retained work or pitch work? To do pitch is more exciting. Web or mobile? Mobile. Independent agencies or networked agencies? <laughs> and that's what I've said. Outsourced production or on-site production? Uh, ultimately on-site. Von Draper or Roger Sterling? <laughs> Draper, of course. And lastly, twist or stick? Twist. Thank you very much.